Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. But before I do, I'm just so overwhelmed by God's mercy and grace that he would pay the ransom for my sin. And I just can't help but want to break out in song. And so will you join with me? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Amen. Amen. What a good God we serve. Mark 2. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was laying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. everybody. Good, 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 good. Let's pray again really fast. Heavenly Father, we come to you now, and uh, we ask um, for you to intervene. There uh, is a lot that we all come in here carrying, and um, when we come in here carrying something, we have an expectation that you're going to take it away. And so right now, Father, uh, I ask that you would uh, take any distractions away uh, in this room so we can continue to focus um, on the task at hand. That's for us to become uh, way makers, God, so we can make a way for people to come uh, to you, Jesus, because you've ultimately made the way to the Father. And we bless you for that, O oh Lord, as uh, Lori uh, reminded us of your amazing grace and how you have provided that way. And we say thank you, Jesus, for how, how good you have been. And I thank you, Lord, for this morning. Uh, as you just kind of moved in my heart as I sat there and uh, thought about how you give and take away, but when you give, you give abundantly. And uh, we're so grateful for that. And so, we want to stop and say thank you uh, as we go into time where we worship in the Word. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said. Yeah, if you could open up to Mark chapter 2, we're going to continue. We started last week on the uh, service of Waymaker. Uh, we are um, moving out of the uh, new perspective and focusing on Waymaker. And all we did was add to the memory verse, guys. So if you didn't memorize the first part the first time in Isaiah 43, 19, all we're doing is say, okay, memorize the second half. Where it says, Behold, I am doing a what thing? A new thing. See that it springs up. 
do you not see it? And we focused on that for a long time because we want to make sure people see it. And that actually came up uh, to me in an email uh, <clears throat> this week. Um, there's a concern, and I, I just want to speak to it. And, and nobody, I don't know if anybody said it, I don't know where it came from, but I should say it. Uh, there is a concern, uh, maybe that first service doesn't understand the need, and so I'm just going to throw out something to you. There were over 400 people here last Sunday. So they may not see the need because they don't see the second service. It's not that they don't care, it's not that they don't want it, they just don't see it. And so I want to remind that uh, to you. But also, you know, Randy had talked about, you know, you know, he was praying, he said, you know, thank you. Um, I want you to know that our ministry, and I can't show this to you, I wish we had the technology, hopefully we'll have a new sanctuary to have that type of technology. Uh, but if I could, I would show you the technology of, you know, we have a ministry where you guys have embraced, and, and I'm able to just literally go into places, and it's too long for me to look through my kids' pictures when they get home. So I mean, I just have to walk in and baptize and, you know, pray with Gloria to receive the Lord the other day, you know? Um, so the need is not just here. It's not just God moving in this building, because God's not contained by a building. Amen? It's never been about a building. God is moving everywhere. He's moving in this county. But praise God, he's allowing us to be a part of that way. Amen? Which goes to the second part of the verse, where it says, I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. And this was under the old covenant, okay? Where God did uh, special things and dispensations. He would fall down and he would do those things. But under the New Testament, we are, as spirit-filled believers, filled with God. God's Holy Spirit is in us. So when we are gathering, we're not just gathering as the body of Christ. We're gathering together, filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit, who is who? God. God in us. Okay? And so he's going to use us to make that way to make for these streams and wastelands, okay? He's going to use us to make streams where water shouldn't normally go. He's going to use us to make paths where paths don't normally go. And he's going to continue to use us as LaGrange First Church of God to do that. And I don't know about you, but despite how uh, I feel this morning with my health, I'll tell you what, I'm about, jumping, about to jump right now, okay? Because like, I get excited about that. And if you don't get excited about that, then I have no idea why you come here on Sunday morning. I do not. I, I know it sounds, okay, thank you, Carrie. It's funny, but it's true. It's like, why do you even waste your time on Sunday? There's actually good TV programming on Sunday morning, okay? Stay home. If that does not excite you, if it doesn't motivate you to see people come to know Jesus Christ and grow in their relationship with Him, then what are you doing here? I am not near as entertaining as the people on television because they make a whole lot more money than I do. Right? Right, okay. I, I like to think I'm a little bit entertaining. So, last week we talked about if you're going to be a way maker, you're going to have to be bold. And we used the guy, Joseph of Arimathea, and how he was bold to go to Pilate and ask for Jesus' body. And how he was bold... Uh, despite people making fun of him or chastising him or telling him no, and he was going to build a tomb. And because he was bold enough to go beyond the no, he was bold enough to be, go beyond the question, he was bold enough to do the wrong thing, even though he was trying to do the right thing, because he built a tomb, that building he built, God used to display his ultimate power that he's ever revealed in all of humanity when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. God did immeasurably more than he could have ever thought because of his boldness. And so therefore, all of us need to embrace this idea that we, if we are going to be waymakers, need to be bold. Now today, the next thing we've got to do is be careless, okay? And I know a lot of you are like, uh-huh. Go with me for a minute, okay? Let's go back to the story in Mark 2, okay? We know this story. If you grew up in church, if you don't know the story, here's the deal. 
right off the scene in the Gospel of Mark. Mark's a little bit different, okay? It quickly touches John the Baptist, and right away, it just kind of thrusts into Jesus' ministry. And Jesus is going around, and he's healing people, and he's doing all these things, right? And so they hear him, and then he kind of comes, goes, comes, goes all around the Galilee, Galilee region, okay? He's not down in Jerusalem. He's up north in the Galilee region. And uh, when he comes, people show up. Why? Because they, want to, they come up, they're sick, they're inflicted, they're hurt. The people who, who, are, who need hope in their life. And so all these people show up because we all have what? Hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Do we not? Yeah. Everybody in this room does. Okay? And anybody who didn't say, yes, you're a fibber. Okay? Like you do. We have them. And we want them taken away. Well, if you heard that there was a man who could make the lame walk and, and, and make people the blind see and do all these other things, you'd show up too thinking, you know what? Even if it's a bunion that's bothering me, he could take care of the problem. And so all these people, because we've all got it, show up and this house is so packed around. And this is what I love about this story, okay? Because all of a sudden these guys who have snatched up their friend who's paralyzed, they've picked him up, okay? You know, that's what we're doing here and that's what the ladies are talking about. And, uh, just because I'm a board member too, sign up to help a Special Olympics, okay? You just do it, all right? That's my promotion. I'm giving them a second push, okay? So, somebody who's paralyzed, these four friends get up and they rush and take their friend. We don't know if they asked them. We don't know if the guy rang them up. Well, they have both sent some smoke signals. I don't know how it worked back then, but they grabbed their paralyzed friend and they ran like they were in the Olympics. And they go on and they see an obstacle in their way. They see an obstacle. There's too many people, and there's no room in the house. So most of us, if, if we're being honest with ourselves as Christians, and we get up, we show up, and we're ready to go, and there's an obstacle that gets in our way, we stop. But not these guys. Absolutely not. They don't wait. They don't go, oh, excuse me, let me get through here. Hello. You know what I mean? Like, oh, uh, I've got paralyzed person. They don't do any of that. They just kind of leap forward, climb up on the house, and rip the roof off the house. I would say to you, that's kind of careless. I would say that's careless. And so, I think this morning, it would behoove all of us, if we're going to, because their carelessness is ripping off the roof, made a what? Way for their friend to be healed, but more than that. And that's the part of the story. See, Jesus has already been healing people. That's not the big deal. This story is about something more. This time... Jesus doesn't just heal somebody. This time, Jesus forgives them of their sins, which is an eternal, an eternal disability, an eternal hurt, an eternal habit, an eternal hang-up that defines where we will be for eternity. So, wouldn't you say, okay, this isn't just Ben being Ben. It's kind of good if you're going to be a waymaker to have some carelessness in you. Right? How good are we, though, as Christians about being careful? Eh? We're careful? I am. <laughs> I don't know about you, but uh, I loved uh, what Randy read uh, in this passage from Luke's Gospel. Uh, I'll flip over there for, to you for you, but I don't know about you, but that's not like the easiest passage in the Bible, for all being honest, for me to obey, okay? Um... Uh, loving our enemies has never been something like I've really perfected. If I looked at you guys and was like, yeah, I've nailed this part of the Bible down. Don't bother me, you know. But I tell you uh, who hear me, love your enemies. He's not like, I suggest this. Okay, guys? Uh, it's a good idea. Love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Do Not dislike you. Not that you're not friends with on Facebook. But those who hate you, those who actively go out of their way to harm you in public, do not think for a minute because a whole lot of people come here. Or maybe you've been blessed enough to go somewhere and say, I go to the church of God. And they go, wow, do you know Pastor Ben? You're like, yes, unfortunately I do. You know, you, <laughs> you know but somewhere out, well, you know, sometimes some people say that, okay? And you're like, wow. You're like, yeah, but guess what? I got enemies too. I got enemies too. There are people who do not like me. And this actually happened to me on Friday. On Fr yeah, it was Friday, Thursday. I can't remember what day it was. It was around the end of the week. It was Thursday. I went and had lunch with somebody. And uh, first thing they did when they sat down, because uh, there's somebody who doesn't like me. It doesn't matter, okay, uh, in the county. And um, 
I did something, let's not just say nice, but maybe immeasurably more than they could have asked or imagined. And this person sat down with me and they said, because they're a part of this thing, and they said, hey, are you on drugs? I was like, well, technically, yes. And I pulled out my Percocet. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I am. <laughs> he said, no, man. Did you really do that? And I said, you bet I did. And he, he looked at me and he said, why on earth did you do that? And you did it twice. And I said, because that's what Christianity is about. Literally, I said, that's what Christianity is about. I said, if I didn't do good and for them, and not just the minimal, but above, then how am I ever going to show them the love of Christ? They're like, well, look, they're, it's not going to change their opinion. I said, I know, but guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to give more money to them than they've ever dreamed of. They said, you're insane. I said, no, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I don't care what they think. I don't care what their opinion is of me. I don't even know them, nor do I know why they don't like me. I am careless in this situation. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because I'm going to continue to make a way. I'm going to see that God puts streams and wastelands and roads and deserts. And if it means I have to spend all of the money you put into local missions for every single dime and then come back and shake your pockets out some more to continue to help those who are in need, I'll do it. And I'll do it in the name of Christ. And I know you'll just keep giving. Because that's what we're supposed to do. Amen? Jesus did not tell us to love those who it's easy to like. Anyone can do that, guys. Ladies, sisters. See, only the careless. Only those of us who say, I don't care what you think. I don't care what your opinion is of me. Only the careless can make a way. Because you know what? That money I spent led to two people coming to church the next week. And they'll be here on Sunday. And they don't even know that it came from our hand. Amen? Isn't that insane how that works out? They didn't even know. They didn't even know. So, get a little carelessness inside of us. You know, there's also... Okay, we, we can see how being careless makes a way here, all right? But there's also, we, we have to understand, you know, we need to surround ourselves with some careless folks, okay? And that can be really hard as well. And I will tell you, as somebody yesterday who uh, not, was not in the right, okay, never buy a house, have a back surgery, and start a close to million dollar campaign in one week. Don't do that. I don't ever want to encourage that to anybody for the rest of your life, but somehow God decided in His infinite wisdom to align all three of those things in my life at this moment, okay? And that's what happens. So if I see not just in pain, but maybe grouchy, tense, look tired, angry, sad, it's probably an honest to God real emotion from beginning to end. Just know I'm kind of struggling through that right now. Even though I shouldn't worry about those things, I do. And, uh, as uh, so, gra so graciously, uh, Greg immediately hopped up when we bought this house and said, hey, I'm going to get a group of people to move you. Um, immediately, my wife, who likes to uh, just disdains my, me and my role, not me preaching, but she can't stand I get up here and air our dirty laundry just in story. But now that I'm going to let people into our house to see our dirty laundry, um, was just, I don't know if she was to the roof, but like Ben, uh, I always am doing the value proposition. Free labor, paid rental people. You know what I mean? I'm like, Greg, do your thing. You know what I mean? And, uh, of course, I can't lift, lift anything over eight pounds. And generally, I'm not in very good uh, spirit. And God bless my mother-in-law. She's 78 years old. And you guys saw my father-in-law. You know, he has a lot of vigor, you know, in him. Uh, and my mother-in-law does too for 78, but I gotta tell you, it's been weighing down as she's watching the kids. So this final week, the final countdown comes, and we're trying to get everything put together. Well, I can't do anything. My mother-in-law's whipped, 
and Kristen, it has to work some silly fashion show in Indianapolis, okay? So we can't get everything done that needs to be done. And God bless Ethel and Tina. They came over and were trying to, you know, put things together for everybody and pack stuff up in boxes. You know, and now at this point, I'm starting to have buyer's remorse and thinking it'd been great if Greg helped, but maybe we should have paid people to do this. And then, on top of it, because you don't want people to see your dirty laundry. I'm serious, right? So you want to get in the box right away as fast as you can because a bunch of people are coming over. Or you don't want people to know that you have like 80 pairs of shoes because now Tim will never let me know that, let, let that down. Or that Tim may know, or Greg, or whoever moved my closet, that I have nine suits, okay? And I see that they stack them all up. Like, oh, if you can't wear one suit one time, you're in, and so, uh, I have all of that. And uh, so, you know, I'm already nervous about that. It's tense. Kristen has to go to this fashion show in India on Friday. And I'm thinking, what kind of demonic boss do you work for? Joe Greenlee's daughter. You know, <laughs> that would make you go down, <coughs> see there in Florida. That would make you go down the night before we move to this thing. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding about Janet. Janet's an awesome person. So, would make you go down and do that. So, I'm already stressed out. We don't have the house finished. Everything's got, you just, you know, it's not coming together like we hope. And Kristen can't get back. She's the only one who's physically able to put everything together, okay? So I'm starting to care. Do you understand where I'm going with this? I'm starting to care a lot, okay? A lot, a lot of care. And so as I'm caring and caring and worrying, it's actually worrying, okay? So I'm worrying and worrying, and my mother-in-law's worrying. We're like, how are we going to get all this done? And, and Kristen's the only mobile one who's here, and she's tired, and she's not going to get back to 1 in the morning, so we all wake up at 4, okay? So we thought at 4 we could get the dirty stuff we don't want people to see, or wrap up the electronics and put all that stuff away, or hide them, you know, 600 pairs of shoes, and whatever it is we got to do. And we all get up at 4, and uh, I wake Kristen up, and she goes, hey, I hit a deer last night. And I said, what? She said, I hit a deer. And I went, oh, so I'm thinking, you know, she's okay, she's here. Uh, she came back from India, I'd never asked, are you okay? Yes, I didn't do that, okay? So now, I'm sitting there, and uh, I'm thinking, like, well, what's going on? And she kind of goes on. She's like, well, it was the, you know, I hit it, and the car starts, I'm like, the car starts smoking. So I go outside, and it's dark, but it's not hard to see that, like, the whole front end, she hit, like, a 12-point buck, okay? Um, I don't know how she made it home. So everybody comes. Now I am super careful. I'm super worried. I'm super intense, and... I will tell you guys, like all these people are showing up in our yard, the car, I don't know what to do, I'm, I'm telling Greg, Greg's like, it's cool, this is what Kent does, I'm like, I don't need one more person in my circle, you know what I mean, but now I gotta let you, you know, so, you know, Kent comes in, and, and Greg comes in, doesn't know that they've walked into like this massive fight between my mother-in-law and Kristen and I, you know, right before all this, because we're trying to control everything, we're trying to be careful. And yet there's an army of men in our front lawn that want to help, and now we're down a car. And yet here sits Kent, who literally does this. Like, 90% of his business is taking care of cars that deers kill. That you, you guys miss in shooting, okay? And he's like, oh, it's no problem. And did I mention I switched car insurance, like, just a week before that, after 18 years? Normally I'm like, oh, I'll call. No, I got some local person whose number I don't know. I'm like, oh, what do I do? Man, Kent jumped into action. He didn't ask permission. He just jumped in. He's like, I'll just take pictures. Do, do, do. I'm going to call the police. I'm going to get it all over here. Greg's like, do all this and that. And all of a sudden, you start freaking out a little more, right? Because you're out of control. But around you are 15 people who are careless. They don't care what you think, man. Now, thank God they're not into ripping off my roof. But they got no problem ripping everything out of my house and moving it into my next house. And despite all that out of control feeling that I had in my life, if it wasn't for all these people, some of you I'm looking at right now, Tim, Kent, Dwayne, Greg, you made a way, right? You didn't ask for permission, you just did it and you got it done. Ethel didn't ask for permission to cook and feed everybody. She just did it. And they made a way. Randy made a way. I'm going to miss names if I keep doing it. 
you made a way. And that's the point here, is whether or not it's hard for us to make a way by loving our enemies because we don't get to choose that, right? We've got to love our enemies. And by loving our enemies, it'll actually make a way. Whether or not it's hard for us to allow other careless people around us to make a way, it's going to be hard to be careless. It is. But it's something that indefinitely makes a way. Whether it's in my personal life, or in this community, or in this paralytic man's sense, it makes a way by being careless. Now, I told everybody the sermon was going to be a lot, very short, and it is this week. And that's my message to you, is to be careless. And you go, I'm going to go home and see my family. And the message is, we talked about the, to be careless. Yes. That's what I'm telling you to do. Because Christians, we are just way too focused on being careful. We want to play it safe. That, that's why Jesus had to tell us to love our enemies, okay? That's where we're careful in loving people, right? Because when we love somebody, we want to give love to those who we like. Because we know they'll reciprocate the love in an appropriate fashion. So we're careful with how we do that. We're careful with our friends because we know, you know what? Because you know, I, I want to be careful with my friends because if I let them too far in, they may see my dirty laundry and they may make fun of my 85 shoes. I know Tim's going to razz me for it. That's okay because Tim kept making a way. Those people are careless. So whether we're called to be careless, we're also called to surround ourselves with careless people in our lives. And that's how we're going to make a way. So my only two questions to you are this. In regards to this story, one, who are you carrying right now? And you don't get to say Pastor Ben if you moved me yesterday. That, 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 that day's over. Who are you carrying right now in your life? Then you'd be like, well, Ben, I don't know anybody that's paralyzed. Um, well, then go sign up for Special Olympics. But if you understood what the gospel writer is trying to say here in the Gospel of Mark, the story is not about the paralytic. See, this is the first time that Jesus will declare that he is the Son of God by forgiving sins, not just healing. The story is about him just healing the paralytic. They've seen magicians do this type of work before. No, they've never seen somebody declare that their sin was absolved before. So what it is for you is this. Okay, maybe you can't, you don't have, know anybody to carry, although if you don't, sign up for Special Olympics. But really, that's just a temporal thing. That's just about somebody who's being paralyzed. Who are you carrying in your life who has a sin problem, who doesn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ that needs to know the love of God, or has walked away from the Lord? Who are you carrying? Don't tell me you don't know somebody who doesn't know Jesus Christ. If you don't, then just walk outside and I'll help you find someone. They're real easy to spot. You say, hallelujah, brother or sister, and they just look at you like that, and they, yeah, there you go, one. It's easy to fish for. Who are you making a way for? It doesn't have to be random stranger on the street. It can be your daughter. It can be your co-worker. It can be your uh, uh, spouse. It can be anybody that randomly walks up to you. What are you doing to make a way? And know this, carrying around a paralyzed person is not easy. It's not easy. It's heavy. Yes, true. Thank you, Don. That's true. But you know, you can never carry somebody else's sins for them. Did you know that? Only Jesus Christ could. And these men carried that man all the way, thinking they were going to make a way by ripping off the roof 
to get this man healed. And he got something more. He got a relationship with Jesus. All bearers goes, who you know at school that needs to make a way, that you need to make a way for? It's hard at your age, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's real hard because what people say in school at your age is so mean. I get it. But you've got to be careless. You can't worry about what people think or what they say. And let me tell you this. I'm just looking at you now because you have people in service. Us old folks dealing with it too. We get worried. We worry about every single thing you could possibly think of when it comes down to that. The man who led me to Christ, I've talked about him taking me on a fishing expedition. I am sure you can remember that from last Easter. I won't tell that story. But I can tell you this. He was so determined to make a way that at my lowest of lows in my life, I mean, this place, I, this place I was living was bad. And I'm not talking like people came in and sold like, you know, uh, a dime bag here and, you know, we bought a case of beer for some underage kids every now and then. I'm talking about this place ran real drugs on a nonstop basis. And this man had the audacity to show up with a Bible around some straight real thugs and sit down and try to talk about Jesus with these people. Now, you may say, well, what, what, you know, how's he carrying you? <laughs> Where's he carrying me? You know what he's putting on the line right now? If somebody even raided that place, he's just as you know, liable or culpable as anybody else in this place. He could have been shot, guys. Remember what I went to jail for? I've seen people get shot. This man did not care, and he came in like a straight-up Mormon, but he was an evangelical, ready to go. And he wasn't afraid, because he was determined he was going to make a way. And he sat there for hours, unashamed. He didn't care. He just kept talking about Jesus. And he kept sitting in this puke-filled, drug-infested in part of, oh my gosh. I almost laughed before I think about it. And he made a way. He was carrying me. Do you know it took him almost five years to carry me? Five years. Putting himself in God knows what to make a way. So again I ask you, who are you carrying? If I only ask you simply this, if you are carrying people, what obstacles are in your way? The only reason you have an obstacle in your way is because you do not have an eternal perspective. If you always have an eternal perspective, I don't care what gets in your way. That's when you see people like me. We just, I don't listen to the law. I don't care. I'm going to get out of my business and do it. And I will worry about the problems later. And too many believers are too careful instead of being careless about what's in the way. I mean, think about this story. You can go, hey, how much was your roof? Because we're about to tear it up. I'll pay, I'll pay you later. There's nothing about him pinning a note saying, I'll fix it later. There's no, I gave him a, a, che a blank check and a card. Call this guy. There's none of that. They don't care. They just were going to make a way. That was not an obstacle. But man, we can think of obstacles in our life all day long, can we not? And the obstacles, they don't have to be a roof, okay? They don't have to be a barrier of people. They just have to be someone's opinion. They just have to be culturally uh, uh, acceptable manners. That sometimes that's the biggest way there is. Don't mess with the way we do things. Oh my goodness. If you mess it. Do, oh my. The first time we didn't have a chair. Because we were trying to. Chair point. Because we were trying to speed along service. Do you know how many emails I got? Phone calls. As if Jesus Christ wasn't here. Because we had, we had something we had to do. We have those traditions still. No we are not that church today. But I'll tell you. Tradition gets within all of us. And look at me too. 
Within me too. Fair question. Within me too. But it's really easy for those things to become a barrier. And I'm going to tell you a story as we close. Because I think sometimes cultural traditions can be our biggest barrier. Randy, you can come up. You can bring the band up. I take it very seriously what God calls leaders to be in the Bible. And there is a passage in the Bible where it says that uh, the leaders of the church, their children should not be, um, they should be above reproach. Okay, they shouldn't, uh, they should love God and their family, their homes should be together. And at my first church, I, I, I just interpreted that they should, you know, their kids should come to youth group. And uh, that's not what it means, but that's how I interpret it in all my infinite wisdom of 22 and being a Christian for maybe nine months. Um, so we had an elder at my first church. His name was Devereaux. They were Cajun. We called them Devs for short. And I saw him on Sunday mornings, but the kid never came to youth group. And one Sunday, I went and I sat down by him because if you know me, you know, I don't know a stranger. And if you don't come, if you're a youth and not youth group, you're going to get there one way or the other. I'm going to make a way. And so I sat down with Dez and I started listening to Dez. I finally went to a special school. Um, not like Charles Xavier X-Men special school, but it was, it was pretty close. He was like a super genius. And people moved their parents, like all from around, or their kids from around the country to go to the schools called uh, JCIB. Uh, ask me what that means. I don't remember, but I remember JCIB. And uh, he went to this special school in Birmingham. Super, super, super smart kid. And um, I've listened to him. And this kid, I mean, you ever met like some really smart people? You know what I'm talking about? Like it's just they don't think like all of us, you know, and you, you, you feel like your, your IQ is nothing compared to them. And this kid is blowing my mind. He's asking me questions about like different dimensions and God and you know, I, don't, I don't know. You know, I just know Jesus. And I felt like this kid needs Jesus. Now, Jesus is the way to the Father, but I need to make a way for this kid to experience Jesus because that's really what goes on. See, he lives in his head. See, God's gifted him, gifted him with his mind, but unless he has this experience with Jesus, he's never going to know Jesus. He's got to be around other believers. And when he's in Sunday morning with all these other people, how's he going to know what's going on? So i got to make a way. Now, here's what happens. I tell him to come Sunday or Wednesday night. I want you to eat fruit. I want you to come. I need you to experience Jesus, not just hear about Jesus, but be around other believers like you, Debs. So we get all the kids there on, on Wednesday night. We get ready for youth group. But I keep waiting in the time that I'm watching the time. I'm waiting for Debs. Debs doesn't show up. It's 631. And instead of starting youth group, I just tagged my wife and said, take over. I'm going to go get Debs. And she just said, who? I went, Debs. Who? Skip Massey's kid. Why? Kid. To make a way. So I got in my car. The youth pastor, paid youth pastor, left the church, left youth group, left the kids, left my wife. She was, she's still mad. Go ask her about this story. She is not happy. Had no message prepared, okay? Like, knows no idea of what's going on. We're still new, and I get in my car, and I'm just so angry. I don't even think that this is like me breaking and entering. I don't think that I'm breaking cultural norms. I don't think that I might be offending. All I know is, is what I understand the Bible to see, and I know that Debrick has questions about God, and I know that Debrick needs Jesus. And so you know what? I drove my car all the way up to his house. I didn't knock. I walked in. I saw, I can tell you this day, they were eating baked chicken, mashed potatoes, and green beans. I'll never forget for the rest of my life. I walked in the door, and I said, make it to go, Debrick. Row, you're going to me with the church of me. And everybody stopped and looked at me. And she said, do you want me to put it in the container? I said, just keep the plate and let's go. And he brought a plate of fried chicken, <laughs> potatoes and green beans in my car. And into the youth. This is, I was like, Jeff, this is why people don't like you. <laughs> I'll never forget that story. They came to visit. 
Here's that kid I was uh, introducing you guys that had memorized the entire, uh, I think it was Book of Luke at that point. Helps, leads his youth group. Where would he be today if somebody wasn't careless enough to say, make it to go, Devereaux. It's time to make a way. The reality is this. We can walk out of here today and we can be careful and we can love those who it's easy to like, right? But we got to be careless and go love those people who no one likes and they may not like us back. Or maybe you're doing that and you're like me. You think you got it all together and you know everything. You do all these awesome things for people. But when you get crippled and you can't do something, I can't express to you how amazing it is that God puts other careless people in your life to make a way. And everybody in this room falls in that category. And if you need those people in your life, that's why you sign up at the Welcome Center. Okay? And if you don't have that carelessness in your spirit, that's why you should come down to these altars now and give your life over to Jesus. Or you sing right now that you surrender all. Which is what Randy's going to lead us in now. Stand up and sing to Jesus sounds so ludicrous as I think about it, God. Because it's so heavy, and yet for some reason we don't want to let it go. We, we do not want to let go what others think about us. We do not want to let go our control. But God, I ask that you give everybody in this room the strength this week to let go and be a little more careless in our relationship with you. Because by being careless as spirit-filled believers, we will see people come to know you in a new way. Help us to continue to be waymakers. Help us to continue to strive to make 
streams in the wasteland help us to make paths in the desert. I ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Hey, I'm ready, everybody. Two things you can surrender this week are really easy. What others care about you and whatever it is you're trying to cover up. Be a little more careless. In the, I'm not talking about right out being careless. I, I should have made that. <laughs> I was only given a short time this morning. I took a short time this morning. I hope you will understand what I mean. Somebody please don't send me an email and be like, you know, if we were all careless, we, you know. I hope you get what I meant. So raise your hands and receive the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine down upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord continue to look upon us all with favor. And may the Lord grant to us his peace. Have a great day, everybody.